one of the things we want to be really intentional about here at Green is always practicing grace and allowing people to have a freedom of choice in their own lives to do what is best for them and for their family. But we also want to make those kinds of things available to you. And so that's why we're doing that clinic here today. Uh, it's not a mandatory thing. You are not going to be uh, walking in uh, out of church today in a line that's directed for you to go and get a vaccine. We're just making it available for you if you would like to have it. And mainly because we are seeing that uptick and because we've had a few cases here. So just trying to, uh, if we err, if we are, if we are going to err, we do that on the side of caution and grace and concern for our children and our most vulnerable in our community. So a big, huge thank you to Dr. Lowry for um, his work with us today. So now what we're going to do uh, is we're going to worship together. I always, I'm a huge sports fan, and I like when you get, go to a sporting event and they sort of like get you all geared up and kind of psyched up for the sporting event, like they used to say on Monday nights, like, are you ready for some football? And, and I might have been in my house not ready for some football. But when they say, are you ready for some football? I'm like, I'm ready. I am ready. I am now ready for some football. Because you said, are you? Are you ready for some worship? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's pray together and let's begin worship with one another. God, thank you so very much that you give us this opportunity to come and just pour out our hearts toward you and to be together, together as a church, together as a community, together, God, as your children. Thank you so very much for loving us, even when we are unlovable, even when we are disobedient, you love us. And so we're going to sing about that today, and we're going to sing about what it means in our lives and how it always leads us to be a people of hope, a people of resurrection. So remind us of that, God, today as we sing together, as we worship, as we pray, and as we hear your word spoken and taught. We love you so much. we pray all that we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship.
Stop working, you never stop. Sing it again. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Come on, church, let's sing it again. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Who you 
break, church. Yeah, come on up, come on up. Well, Pastor Lerner is coming up. Why don't you turn and share a smile and uh, maybe a fist bump or a, just a, a wave and pass the peace of Christ. I kind of hate to break this up, but I'm going to invite you to find your way back to your seats and have a seat. I want to welcome you again. Um, so glad that you're here in worship today. What an awesome morning. And to be able to come in and sing a song that reminds us of who we are and whose we are. And to get to sing like that, that's just absolutely fantastic. Thanks, you guys, so, so, so very much. It's been quite an interesting week this week in the life of our community. And there's lots of different things that are going on. But uh, one of the things that has been so very clear to me is that this church continues to do works of mercy and grace, no matter what the distractions are, no matter what else might be going on, there's, there are still things happening here that make a difference in the lives of people. This week I've had the opportunity to call different people who put in prayer requests, asking us as a church to be in prayer for them, opportunities to hear their stories, and then opportunities to hear them say things like, you know, you just don't know what it means to me to know that my church is praying for me. And so if you want, would like for someone to pray for you, let us know that. Let us know. You can email us. You can fill out a prayer card. Let us know how we can be celebrating with you like those great, 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 great joys that you're experiencing in life. And let us know how we can pray for you when you're finding yourself in waters that you've never had to navigate before. Maybe that wake you up in the middle of the night. You're not sure. Waking up in the middle of the night and knowing that you're your brothers and sisters are praying for you, can make all the difference in the world. So let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know that you're here today. Register uh, your attendance. You can do that online. Just let us know that, that you're here in worship with us and let us know how we can um, reach out to you and like live life with one another, share in those things with each other. Um, there's also ways that you can give um, to the life of the church because in order for the ministries to continue to take place the way that they do, it, it relies on the generosity of God's people. And so as our ushers make their way forward for our time of offering, I would just remind you that you can do that online or you can um, put it in baskets outside or you can uh, put it in the plate as it's passed to you. And so I'm going to invite you now, if you would, um, to pray with me. Before we pray, I want to tell you what a joy it is for me. Uh, almost, almost every Sunday that I've been here, uh, you know, all four of them, um, it's like speaking like I really know, right? Um, it's been a tremendous joy to a couple of things in worship that have really meant a ton to me. One is just a few minutes ago when Jackson said, let's just hear your voices. And I'm standing in the front and I can hear all of you, like the unrehearsed choir and band, right? Singing to the God who loves you. I also sit in the front and so almost every Sunday that I've been here, I've been able to watch the joy of Riley as he dances while we sing, and what a beautiful testimony that is to the goodness of God. Thanks, Riley. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we do give you thanks for your presence here with us today and your presence in our lives every moment of every day. From the moment we open our eyes to the moment that we close them and all while we sleep, you are present, God. And so we pray this morning for this offering that as we give it, we would give it with glad and grateful hearts, not reluctantly, but God, with expectation, with anticipation that you will take the gifts that you've already given us and that we're returning to you and that you will use them in ways that change the world we live in. We trust you with every part of our lives, God, and we trust you with our offering um, that you, God, will use it uh, to further your kingdom. We thank you, God, for the opportunities that you give us to see uh, your presence and your movement in our lives. And we thank you that we can be called precious children of God. And so as your children, we lift our voices together now and pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy
shout you please. tell you that this morning the, the band got here early as they do every Sunday and um, we're just you know going through the songs before the service started and that song they were singing that song and there were only a few of us in here at the time and worship broke out before worship so it's really really quite awesome 
Um, I'm going to invite you to pray with me if you would. God, we're, we're looking at your word today and we're praying that you would open our hearts to hear it. I ask, I ask you, God, if, to fill me with your spirit and let the words that come forth not be my own but yours, Father, to your people, to me, to us. Let your word change our hearts and lives. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I thought today it would be kind of nice to look at one of the uh, guys in the Old Testament. This is a really cool dude from the Old Testament. His name is Nehemiah. Has, he's written one of the Old Testament books. And the story of Nehemiah is a really fascinating story. We're going to look specifically at some of the verses in chapter 6. But before you get there, you kind of have to know what's been going on in the life of Nehemiah and in the world around him. And it kind of gives you a picture, a kind of a snapshot into his heart into his heart toward God and his heart, his heart toward God's people. So Nehemiah is a governor, and so he's a, a, a man of high power. Um, he works directly with the king, has access to the king, and, and people know that about him, but he's, a, he's like a good guy, and he has a good relationship with the king. So there's been a lot that's taken place, and, and Nehemiah ch wants to check on the people of Israel. He wants to know how they're doing, and so he asks, how are the people doing who survived, who survived the captivity? How are they? And they report to him, and they tell them, tell him it, it isn't good. The situation is really quite dire. In fact, all of the walls of the city have been burned down. The people are suffering. They're oppressed. They're poor. And they have no place of protection and no place to call home. And in chapter 1, it says that Nehemiah heard this news and he wept. Like he cried and he wept. And it says that he mourned and he fasted and he prayed. Like he did what God was leading him to do in those moments. He's like, instead of, I'm going to tell you the truth, like sometimes when people tell me things, I have to stop for a moment and think about it because the, my default, the way I would just do it like in my own spirit is to react immediately. Like somebody comes in and tells me something that isn't good, I'm like, oh, 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 mm -mm, nope. Like I'm ready. I'm ready right then and there. Let's go. Nehemiah knew that wasn't the way to do this. And that this was so important and so crucial. He poured out his tears toward God. He poured out his heart for the people. And he prayed. And he asked God, like, you're the God who's been steadfast in your love. You've always been faithful. Like, in this prayer, he confesses that the people have been wicked toward God. That there's been sin. And he asked for forgiveness. And he's like, now show us what to do. And when God tells Nehemiah to go and rebuild those walls, he does it. He does it in such a grace-filled way. Like, he doesn't go to the king and say, look, here's what's happening. This is what I'm doing. I'm out. You know? Like, I got to go. Peace out, River Trout, because I'm going to go do this, and I don't care what you have to say about it. Like, Nehemiah goes to the king, and he's like, you know, my heart is broken for my people, and I, I know that God is calling me to do this. And the king actually allows him to go and to gather the people together and rebuild the walls of the city. This is a great and powerful work that Nehemiah is about to do and engage the people of Israel in. And I believe that just about any time God begins to prepare his people for a great work of mercy and grace and love in the world, that there is going to be opposition to that. It may not be true in your life, but almost every time, time in my own life where God is about to move in an incredibly powerful way, distractions and opposition move in. And that's exactly what happens, in fact, in chapter 2. It says that there were, some, there were some men that when they heard that someone was coming who had the interest of the people of Israel in their heart, they were disturbed. They were disturbed. And they're in opposition to what's going to take place. Like Nehemiah is going to do a great work, a work that God's called him to do. And there are people that are like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Sanballat was one guy's name. Tobiah was another guy's name. Geshem was another one's name. And they all plotted together. Like, how can we make this stop? 
You see, they wanted the people to stay exactly, the, they wanted the Israelite people to stay exactly the way they were, oppressed and under their thumb, not free, not living the life that God called them to live, but being oppressed. And so in chapter 6, what takes place is that they're, they're doing this great work, and, and it's interesting how they're doing it. It says that at times, because they knew they were the possibility of attack was there, that there were at times where they were working with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Working to do God's work. And so this, in chapter 6, I want to read you uh, the first nine verses of chapter 6, and we're going to talk about what happens um, in this space, in, in these verses in the Bible. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, um, it says this. Now when it was reported to Sanballat and Tobiah and to Geshem the Arab and to the rest of our enemies that I had built the wall and that there was no gap left in it, though up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Oh really appropriate titled village, wouldn't you think? And I want to just stop and, and, and talk about this for just a moment. Like so often when we are as a church doing exactly what we know God is calling us to do, right? And it's going the way we are so excited about it going and there's vision and there's passion and the people are like on fire for doing what God told them. There's, there's almost always going to be someone who invites you to the plain of oh no. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you don't. Like, I just think this is such a great, I mean, I love to talk about this. I'm going to leave me alone, you village of oh, no. Anyway, invited, to, invited him to the villages in the plain of oh, no, but they intended to do me harm. Nehemiah is a wise man. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop? while I leave it to come down to you. So also in this invitation, when we're doing what God calls us to do, in sort of like secular terms, you might say that that's taking the high road, there's always gonna be an invitation to come down to the low road, to take the easy way or the way that people are happy with and everybody will like you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a personality typing test called Enneagram. But I did a little bit of work around that. In the beginning, I was like, oh, I'm totally a, a type two. I'm an Enneagram two. I like for people to like me. I like to help people. And so I was on my way to actually a conference where they were going to be talking about the Enneagram. And my daughter, who's really into this stuff, right, she calls me on the phone and we're talking. And I'm on my way to Dallas. And she says, hey, I just want to know, are you prepared to hear that you're not, an, you're not actually a two? on the Enneagram, I'm like, well, of course I'm a two, I'm a helper, I do all these kinds of things, I'm really, I'm really a two, she goes, no mom, you are a seven, you are a hard seven on the Enneagram, and uh, I was like, oh my goodness, I think that maybe I really actually might be, and yet at the same time, um, I know that sometimes it can be very hard for me to do things that are unpopular, I can even know it's the right thing to do, but I'll be distracted and invited to the plains of Ono, oh and I'll think, who's going to be mad at me about this? Who's like going to be offended? And sometimes I have to spend some time just with God being reminded that when we are called to a great work, we cannot be distracted from it, and that sometimes it's not going to be um, what makes everyone happy. So we don't. What this scripture is telling us is like Nehemiah saying, "I'm not coming down to where you are. I'm not coming down." Why would I leave the work of God to come down to where you are? I love that. He goes on to say, uh, beginning with verse 4, they sent to me four times in this way. These people are pretty, you know, pretty persistent. They sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same way. I'm not coming. I'm not leaving God's work to come down to where you are in the same manner. So in the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And this is what the letter said. And it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. 
And according to this report, you wish to become their king. You have also set up prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. There is a king in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these words. A little threat. I'm going to tell on you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell on you. I'm going to tell the king what you're doing. So come, therefore, and let us confer together And Nehemiah. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from their work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So when Sanballat sends to Nehemiah and says, listen, we, we have an idea of what you're doing. He, he's trying to implant a spirit of fear in Nehemiah. And I want to suggest to you, because I believe it's really true, that in our world today, we still have Sanballats. We still have people called Tobiah. We still have the Geshems of the world who, when a great work is being done for the kingdom of God, want to implant in each one of our spirits a fear that this is not what we should be doing, a threat that I'm going to tell on you and you're going to get in a lot of trouble for this. Uh, you better cease and desist right now. And what Nehemiah says back to them is a line that I, I, I just find very fascinating and interesting. Uh, people tell me things like when they say, I, you know, I tried to read the Bible and it's kind of boring. I'm like, then you didn't. <laughs> Obviously, read it. Because Nehemiah is like, you know what? You made that stuff up in your own head. None of it's happening. None of it's taking place. We are doing this great work, this work of grace and this work of mercy, this work to rebuild what belongs to God's people and to God. And we're not going to be stopped by threats of fear. We're not going to be stopped by threats of like, I'm going to report you. This is going to go to the king. You're going to be punished. We're not going to be stopped in doing what God has called us to do. And man, I am praying and I want to invite you to join me to pray as well that that is absolutely true for Green United Methodist Church. That we are about a great work. This I have When I first got called and said, we'd like to send this invitation for you, uh, and when the bishop calls and sends an invitation, it doesn't really come with an RSVP. <laughs> and that being said, it really, that's not 100% accurate. You, there are situations where you can say, I don't really think that's where, but my husband and I came out here and we prayed here and we knew this is where we were supposed to be. This is where God was calling us to be. And so we said yes the next day. Because I had like 12 hours to decide. Right? <laughs> you can pray hard in 12 hours, let me tell you. Um, so I did my research on this church. I really looked back across the history of this church. And what excited me was the passion and the vision of the people. And how people in this church care about the people who are living in those kinds of places where the walls have been torn down, where the city has been burned, and where there are people who would we prefer they just stay as oppressed as they are. I, I read about and I heard about how this church did not accept any invitations to the Plains of Ono. And I know we're in a lot, a lot of different circumstances than you were before, before a pandemic, before legitimate fear and sometimes fear that didn't really have a place for us, right? Before all of that, I, I saw where you were and I believe that that's what we're calling, being called to do again. I, I know... Things have changed because of this pandemic, and I really am working very hard to keep an eye on it and at the same time say, we are going to gather together in the safest way we know how, and we are going to worship together, and we're going to pray for one another, and we're going to keep doing this work. There are so many, so many invitations 
to the plane of o the plains of Ono. We just have to be really careful that we don't accept those invitations, that we say, oh no to oh no. That's what we do. And we trust in God. And so when they said, we're going to distract you so much that you're going to put down everything you're working with and the work will stop and it won't be completed. What was Nehemiah's prayer? Strengthen my hands. Strengthen us in this. That's how we're going to respond as a church. You've been doing it. We're going to, we're going to move back into that again um, and not let things stop us. In 1999, I was 12. <laughs> in 1999, uh, my husband and I were living in a little bitty town called Mumford, Texas. It's just outside of College Station. My husband's degree from Texas A&M is in horticulture with an expertise in pecans. My dad says it's really helpful that my husband went to A&M and studied nuts for five years since he's married to me. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. So for the first, um, I don't know, however many years of our marriage, every move that we made was a move around a pecan orchard because there were always churches. I could go anywhere, right? And I was in youth student ministry. So I was at A&M, and Robert was, uh, we were living in this little town and living across the street from the orchard where he was managing that pecan orchard. And our oldest son had graduated from high school and had, was, uh, had moved away and was living with friends and going to school and working. And um, the three younger children who we used to refer to as the little people, um, they were all still at home. And so we lived in this little, just beautiful little house out in the country with lots of land. It was just fabulous. And as per usual, Robert was awake uh, before everybody else this particular morning. And he came into, back into our room and he said, Lorinda, I think you need to wake up. And I think you need to get headed toward the church immediately. And I'm like, what, what is happening? It was November the 18th, 1999. And Robert said, there's been an accident and bonfire has fallen. And I really think you need to head toward the church. I'll get the kids to school. You just go. So I got in my car, and Mumford's about 30 minutes away from A&M United Methodist Church, and as I got right at the place where you would either turn to go into Bryan or turn to go into College Station, my phone rang, and it was the senior pastor of A&M United Methodist Church, Charles Anderson, and he said, Lorinda, I need you, instead of coming to the church, I need you to go to the hospital, because Tim Curley is in ICU. His parents are still in Tennessee, and they don't think he's going to survive this. Tim was in my Sunday school class. He was a freshman at A&M. So I went to the hospital, and this is, particular hospital is where I did uh, two years of CPE, which is clinical pastoral education, and so I knew the chaplain there really well, and so he took me into ICU, and as he was taking me into ICU, he said, Lorena, the thing that you need to know before you go in here is that it is impossible for this young man to survive the injuries he sustained. And so as I was walking into that room, and this is a part of my faith story, and so you will hear more uh, as we spend the next years together around this. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about what happened in the hospital, but when I was walking into that ICU room, so my son was 18. And I was praying, I'm like, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And he, God spoke into my heart. He said, I want you to say and do what you would want someone and say to do for Justin until you could get here. And so I went into the room, and Tim was conscious, but he couldn't talk because he was innovated. And so he, rec he knew me, and I stayed with him and never left the hospital until Tim died. His parents came. I thought I would leave when they got there, but they were like, please don't leave us. So I didn't. This is what I want to tell you happened that Saturday. Of course, at A&M UMC, we had our Sunday worship service planned. Our bulletins were printed out. The musicians were ready to go. Everything was set. And it was a beautiful thing to watch as people really leaned into and lived into their areas of greatest giftedness. Charles Anderson is amazing 
at putting people in the right places and organizing and administrating and all those sorts of things. So we all as a staff met together on Saturday to rewrite the entire service and make it a memorial for the 12 young men and women who died at Bonfire and specifically for Tim Curley Jr. My, one of my areas of greatest giftedness is being present with people in really hard times and so I stayed very much with the family. But we wrote that, we wrote, rewrote that entire service, redid all of the bulletins, made everything geared around what that community was struggling through and going through at that time. A little after lunch that day, we learned that a group from out of state who called themselves, themselves a church but really weren't, they were coming to College Station and they were going to picket that young man's funeral. And they were clear that they were going to hold up signs that said things like, this is God's punishment on Texas A&M University. Signs that said, God is glad your son is dead. A very powerful invitation to the plains of Ono. Oh and especially for me, because I was a lot younger then, I have mellowed a ton <laughs> between then and now. But everyone who knew me knew that if a fight broke out in front of the church, I'd be right in the middle of it. Right, I'm not into physical altercations anymore, but in 1999, I would have physically fought those people. Right, um, it was a strong and powerful invitation to the plains of Ono oh to say, "Stop! Stop this great work of mercy and grace and love that you're doing, and get distracted by hate and anger and misunderstanding. Be afraid." before you do this service that somebody's going to be standing outside your church screaming and chanting and promoting hate. Be afraid of those things. Come to the plains of oh no. Put down what you're doing. Stop your great work and do not allow the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the love of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed in a moment when it's needed so deeply, so profoundly. And we said, no thank you. This is not who we are, it's not who we want to be, and it's not who we will ever be. We will not be distracted, we will not accept the invitation, and we will pray that God will strengthen our hands in this time. And that is what we did, and it was a service that when we walked into it that morning, I've never seen anything quite like this. People were everywhere. The media, national media, was everywhere. When I stood up in the pulpit to speak and to proclaim the word of God, there were microphones everywhere that said NBC, CBS, seeing all these more invitations to the plains of Ono, to tell you the truth, because that instilled a little bit of a spirit of fear in me, right? But no, that's not what we did. And brothers and sisters, that's not what we're going to do here either. There are always going to be the Sambalits and the Geshems and Tobias of the world. There are always going to be those invitations to the plains of Oh No. But we are a people of hope. We are a people of resurrection. We are a people who understand the goodness of God, that he is bigger than all of these things, than all of these oppositions, all of this distraction. God is bigger. He's bigger than us. And we're going to just live into and lean into what God says, here's where I'm leading you, Green United Methodist Church. Here's where I'm leading you. Here's where I want you to be busy about my work with vision and passion, with mercy and grace, with acceptance and love. This is what God's calling us to. And this is what we're going to say. Strengthen our hands, God, because we're on our way. Are you ready for some passion and vision? Let's go. Exciting. 
Let's pray together about that right now. God, you are bigger than any distraction, any opposition, any invitation to the plains of Ono. Oh you are bigger. And it is you that we place our trust in. It is you that we follow. It is your son, Jesus, who died to save us and redeem us and reconcile us to you and to one another. And so that's our prayer. We pray it collectively, Lord God, as a church. Strengthen our hands. Give us courage to align our lives and our will, our passions and our desires and our vision with yours, God, with yours. And we will trust you and we will be confident and we will do this great work of mercy, grace, and love together. Thank you, God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your greatness and your love that is steadfast, unfailing, and faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna stand together and we're gonna sing a song of invitation. There are prayer rails here at the front if you'd like to uh, kneel in prayer, but I invite you to stand and just be reminded of the truth of the words of the song that we're gonna sing. Let's do this. from this morning the message that God brings Pastor Lorenda delivered it but it's the message that God brings to us that in all things just when we think we understand how big God is it's bigger than that yeah. let's sing together speak to me when the silence steals my voice understand me you understand me and come to me in the valley of unknown you understand me you understand me you understand me God you understand Don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. So I stop all negotiation with the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought you were. be 
the rest in the Father's hands. I will rest in the Father's hands. Leave the rest in the Father's hands. Let's rest together. We will rest. We will rest in the Father's hands. glad that you're here in worship today. I hope my prayer for you is that like there's just going to be something a little bit different about you, maybe a little bit more courageous, a little bit more centered as you leave than when you came in. If you walked in here today and there's heartache, um, I'm here. You can come and pray with me this morning. Um, and as you leave today, my prayer for you is that you will go knowing that you don't ever walk out into this world alone. You don't go out there alone. The God that's bigger than you thought goes with you. The God that strengthens your hands and calls you to a great work of mercy and grace and love, that God goes with you. So let's go and not accept those invitations to the plains of Ono, but those invitations to a good and great work. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. So I throw all my cares before you, my dad. Be